Thank you that we're here and we're alive. And thank you that uh, we have a building. There's no rain coming down on us. We're not stuck in a park or something like that. Thank you, Lord, for the muse uh, welcoming us in. Thank you for the people that are here. And Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love and your word. Please be with us as we worship you. We want to worship you in your power, not in our own measly, dumb power. Uh, Lord, help us, help us to sing. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You receive it. 
touch Do as we there's about testify Your prayer. 
saved by grace and I still believe that I still believe I was a sinner saved by grace and I wrote this song believing that I was still a sinner and that was my identity and then later on I learned that my identity is in Jesus Christ amen and so I wrote this song called Jesus and it says friend of sinners when we sing this today, I want to sing this as a prayer straight to Jesus, okay? So here we go. Jesus, friend of sinners, friend to me. Jesus. Okay, church, let me hear you sing it.
the savior of the world. Jesus is the champion. Jesus paid the price in our stead. His blood conquered sin and death. So now we don't have to have an identity as a sinner anymore. We can have an identity in Christ. Redeemed, saved. Not a lowly, dirty thing, but a cleansed thing, a brand new creature. The second Corinthians 5.17 says we're a brand new creature in Jesus. Every mistake, every sin, every failure, paid for on the cross. And that's why we sing Jesus, friend of sinners, and also a friend to me. This is personal. Let's make it personal. Jesus, what church? Make it personal. Make it personal. Jesus, we thank you for rescuing us from ourselves. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for being that ever-present help in time of need. We thank you that we can call on your name and that anything we pray for in accordance to your will and your name is there. We thank you for constantly reminding us in your word that 
we can't do it on our own. That without you, we can do nothing. We read elsewhere that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. We thank you, Jesus, for, our, for the reminder of that. As we sang in the song, it's your mercy, it's your grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you have been saved. And this is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Jesus, forgive us for putting our faith in the things of man, the things that are created things. Forgive us for getting our eyes off of the eternal. We pray today that as we study your word, that it's not just a study, that we, we stay in this mindset of worship and we we want to get to know you better and get closer and closer to you as our, not just the Savior, because we believe you're the Savior of the world. But for us, it's personal. You are Lord. That you own every, every nook and cranny, every, every spot of our lives. Help us to submit everything, our finances, our relationships. How about our bad attitudes? That one's for Sean. What a good God that we serve. All right, church, we're going to just sing this one again, just this chorus. But you don't have to repeat the words on the screen. I want you to sing this to Jesus and make it personal. It doesn't have to rhyme. It doesn't have to be in time. It doesn't have to be in key. Lord knows I have trouble with that one. But what it does have to do is it has to be the song that God put in your heart. Just worship him, church. Here we go. Jesus, friend of sinners, friend to me. Jesus. Now sing from your heart. Lord, thank you that you, you are still sitting on your throne and you're not breaking a sweat and you're not nervous and you're not upset at 
things going askew, you have everything in hand, Lord. Get our eyes off of the water, off of our storm. Get our eyes on you, Lord. Help us to get our eyes back on you, Lord. And now as you speak through Sean and through your word, help us to open our ears and our hearts and our minds so that you can reshape us through your word, through that word that cuts like a two-edged sword through the heart and spirit and soul. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who's sitting at your right hand, even now, interceding for us. Amen. Amen. Okay, you guys can have a seat. So just so you know, if you, if you haven't been here for a while or if you're joining for the first time, we try in worship to have moments where, where you're not just being told what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do. And, you know, you hear a lot about people like going to church and they just told me what to do. You know, OK, so we want to have a moment where we don't tell you what to do to where the music just goes and you just worship freely and sing what's ever in your heart. So that's what that was all about. If you didn't know what that was all about. So uh, feel free to just do that. It's it's out of your comfort zone. I get that. It's one of those things that makes you feel uncomfortable because, oh, no, you know, I've, you know, suddenly uh, there's not a formula and I have to to worship. But. Just feel free to jump right in. No, no one in this church is ever going to judge you for um, singing something just straight from your heart. No one will ever judge that. I mean, if I haven't been judged for wearing death metal shirts and shorts you know, far too late into the season, then no one's going to judge you from singing from your heart, okay? All right, so I'm not going to give you a big intro today because we got a lot of ground to cover, but I am going to tell you that this passage to me is so relevant to right now. Right now, United States 2020, with all the craziness going on, all the unrest, all the social stuff, all the political stuff, all that. And I, the last thing I ever want to do is get political because I'll be honest with you, I follow it a little bit. I probably don't follow it as much as I probably should. I don't pay attention to it enough. You know, if you want to talk politics, Holly's the one that knows more about politics than I do. I don't really know. She, she pays attention. I just know that, you know, I see things on Facebook where I see this person over here doesn't like this person. So yeah, 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 yeah. And find every bad thing they can find. And this person over here doesn't like this person. So yeah, 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 yeah. Find every bad thing they can find. And I'm standing in the middle going, yeah, but what about Jesus? And what I mean by that is that's just another thing that gets people's eyes off of it. Now there are people in the world that don't know Jesus. Hey, that's okay. They got to do their thing, right? We don't judge them because that's, that's who they are. But the people who are in Christ don't need to be doing that. What we need to be doing is preparing. Preparing for what, Sean? Well, let me tell you. Preparing for virgins. No, I mean preparing like virgins. I said that just to be shocking, to wake you up. Christ begins verse, or sorry, chapter 25 by a parable that introduces us to 10 virgins. I had a very different idea of who these 10 virgins were prior to studying this. I thought they were the church. Now, you might be surprised to find out it's not the church, and we'll uncover this here in a minute. So, let's read our passage today. For, uh, this is chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Now, I want to start right here by saying two things to bear in mind as we continue. One, the Bible wasn't written in English. I know that might be a shocker. Right? No, yeah, come on, didn't King James write the Bible? No, <laughs> he didn't. Okay, so it wasn't written in English, number one. Number two, there was a cultural thing going on in that place at that time with colloquialisms that they would understand that we no longer use, customs we no longer have. So here's where it gets tricky. Okay, Mark has said before, if I say the Windy City, what am I talking about? Chicago. Chicago. We all know that. Everybody in our culture knows that the Windy City is Chicago, even though it's not in the top 20 windiest cities in the country. The Windy City is Chicago, because that's what we refer to it as. So there are things that they refer to in the first century that we no longer refer to. Hold on to that. We'll get to that here in a minute. Verse 2, five of them, of the ten, were foolish and five were sensible. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they didn't take olive oil with them. But the sensible ones took oil in their flask with their lamps. Since the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout. Here comes the groom. 
come out to meet him. Then the virgins got up, trimmed their lamps. There's one of those colloquialisms. We'll get to that in a minute. But the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. The sensible ones answered, no, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell and buy oil. Get some for yourselves. When they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived. Then those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the virgins came out and said, Master, Master, open up for us. But he replied, I assure you, I don't know you. We've heard this before, haven't we? Away, you evildoers, I don't know you. Hold on to that one. Verse 13, therefore be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour. Now this is what Jesus is speaking right here in this passage. Let me give you some background that might change this entire scenario, okay? In Jewish weddings, we have, we have to understand a Jewish wedding ceremony to understand this passage. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. May not. Jewish weddings were not like today, okay? Today, you meet a girl, she's hot, right? You, you, you give her some goofy pickup line and she thinks, okay, I guess I'll give this dork a chance. And you date and then you end up eventually getting married. And right, that's how it happens in our culture. Not so in Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, when a boy was very young, the parents of the boy would begin to look for a girl for him to marry. Because in that culture, if you weren't married, that was dangerous for a lot of reasons. Dangerous for the woman, for the girl, because if she's left to her own, there's no protection whatsoever in that culture. Dangerous for the boy, because if he doesn't marry, then there's no children, and he can't possibly make a living because families grew, and they worked together, and they worked the farm, and they, you know, they did things together, and they, you know, Jesus himself, him and all his brothers, along with his dad, made tables and stuff. They were carpenters, right? So it was dangerous not to have a family in a good family unit. So it was very important. So the parents would start looking when the boy was very young. Can you imagine if like five or six years ago, I started looking for Kelsey's wife? What do you think about that, Kelsey? <laughs> he shakes his head no. Okay. So, but that was the culture of the first century and even before that, right? So they had to look for him. So the two families would come together and they would make an arrangement. And part of that arrangement was that as the boy grew up, he would learn a trade most often from his father, like Jesus did with Joseph. And then when he became good enough at it, he would begin to work the trade on his own and make his own living. He'd kind of break off and go, okay, start my own company, my own business and do my own thing and make my own money. And he'd begin to construct a house. This boy would start building a house. He would be in his late teens or early 20s by now, okay? Depending on the house he was building uh, or the trade, he might be into his 30s, but generally into his 20s. When his trade was learned and the house was completed, he would go get his friends together and they would have a wedding parade through the town and go get his bride. So the groom is on the way to get his bride. The groom is coming. See that? See what I did there? With all this going on, the bride was to prepare herself as well, okay? During the years of the groom learning his trade and building his house, she's learning to become a woman, a wife and a mother. She's sewing her own wedding gown. She's learning of the graces of womanhood. She, and since she does not know what day or hour the groom might come for her, sound familiar? She has to be ready for him at all times. Imagine if he shows up and she's not prepared. What happens then? Well, like I said, that's dangerous. She, of course, knows that the hour is drawing near because her friends have seen the house and they've told her and that he's, hey, he just left his dad's workplace. He's got his own business now, right? So, you know, some things are ramping up. Some things are happening. But when exactly does he start the parade? Well, we don't know. They go, hey, he's got a new roof on the house now. You better get ready. That dress better be close to being done. Oh, he put the siding up yesterday. They're moving the furniture in. And you know the day is getting close, and the wedding day draws nearer and nearer and nearer, and she's got to be ready. So, if she was not ready, I mean, it was definitely not a good way to start the wedding or the marriage uh, if he shows up to get her and she's not ready. Right? But if she was ready, she's prepared, and she was ready, they would go off together uh, to his family's house to the complex, where they, that's how they build the house in a complex all together. Again, safety, family unit. 
and they would go to the family complex and they would have a wedding ceremony and a wedding supper for the close friends and family of the bride and the groom. After the ceremony and the supper, there would be a wedding celebration for the whole town. It was a big, massive party, okay? And it was not just for the closest friends and family, but everybody that were, they were remotely acquainted with. Like if they ran into them at Walmart, they were coming, right? If they, if, they, if they went to the gas station and bumped into them, they, they were invited. Everybody, anybody you ever made contact with, everybody imaginable. And there'd be a night of entertainment and celebration. They would have this band play. They, they would rock out. They got this thing going on. And they would have all this entertainment and they would food and dancing and just a great time. And then as we come to this parable of the 10 virgins, for some reason, people want to think that the virgins are the bride, but the virgins are not the bride. So who are the virgins? Well, we know from the parable of the 10 virgins that for some reason, many people think that. But there are some who believe this parable represents the bridegroom coming for his bride. I'm going to say no. That's what Matthew 24, 45 through 51 was all about. But here we have no mention of a bride, but rather 10 virgins. Maybe we could call them bridesmaids. They were part of the bride's wedding party, but they were not the bride, so we can't associate the virgins with the bride of Christ the church. You're probably wondering, what is he yammering on about? Trust me, we will get there. Hang in there. So, who are the virgins? I know, does anybody want to know? Well, then ask me. Well, I'll tell you who the virgins are. Okay, we know from Jewish culture that at the wedding celebration, when the party is going on, when the entertainment's going on, part of the entertainment was, you know, the whole town's there, that the they were the at one of the acts of entertainment was that they were to have ten virgins, surprising ten. That's what Jesus just said. Virgins perform a wedding dance around the bride and groom. They would hold lamps and torches and perform a torch dance around them. It would symbolize the light of their love and the bright future they had together. And they would dance for the entertainment of the guest at the wedding party. And they would dance until the torches burnt out. So these 10 virgins are part of the wedding celebration after the wedding ceremony and the wedding supper. And this is what the parable is about. These dancing virgins is what this is about. But this is a parable. So each member of the parable represents someone or something in real life. So what do these 10 virgins represent? I had to give you that whole background in order to get to this. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. But these virgins, let's start with the easy ones first. The bridegroom is obviously... Christ, right? You obviously got that. You know, you probably heard bridegroom and knew immediately, this is Jesus. In these kind of parables, the bridegroom is always Christ. Secondly, we know there's a bride, but the bride is not mentioned here. And just as the bridegroom is always the picture of Christ, the bride is always the picture of the church. So we have here um, the mention of the, 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 the virgins, but this is where Christ determines which members of his bride were ready for his coming, which were not. See, the bride represents the church. The church is made up of all the people, whether Jews or Gentiles, who have believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life from Pentecost until the rapture. And the church came into existence at Pentecost and ceases to exist um, at the rapture. At the rapture, the church, the bride of Christ, is caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And in heaven, the first event will be the Bema. That's the judgment seat of Christ. So this is where Christ determines which members of his bride were ready for his coming. The bride has to be ready, just like the bride had to be ready in Jewish culture. But after the Bema, there's a wedding ceremony and then a wedding supper. Sounds just like what Jesus is talking about, right? These events take place in heaven during the tribulation and are between Christ and the church. That's us. Now, you should feel just a little tingle of excitement right there. That's us, right? We are the bride. Now, Jesus isn't addressing the bride right here. But understand that there's the implication that there is a bride because there are bridesmaids. Then remember what happens after the, the ceremony and the supper. Then we have the city-wide celebration. The city of heaven. City-wide celebration, right? The bride and the groom go back into the city and invite people to join them in celebrating their wedding. There's food and dancing and entertainment. And this is when the torch dance happens with the virgins. Who are the virgins? They're not the bride. They are not anybody in heaven, so they must be a group of people left on earth during the tribulation. Let that sink in for a second. Who would be left at the tribulation? Well, let's find out. We have to go to Revelation 14, which Mark, by the way, is a little commercial 
one side note, Mark is doing a revelation study uh, over Zoom on Wednesdays if you want to jump in on that. Uh, we're not quite to chapter 14 yet because we just started. I think we're in chapter 3, I believe, right? Three, chap Chapter 3. So we're, we're early on. This is a good time to jump in on it if you haven't been, been uh, uh, jumping in, but that would be a good time. So if you want to get in on that, talk to one of us and we'll get you, get you hooked up. So Revelation 14, though, says this. Then I looked. We have that up there? Okay. Then I looked, and there on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. With him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters, like the rumbling of loud thunder. The sound I heard was also like harpists playing their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. But no one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones not defiled with women, for they have kept their virginity. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from the human race as first fruits for God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. During the tribulation, which follows the rapture of the church, God picks back up with his plan for the nation of Israel. Currently, during the church age, which is where we are right now, the church age, Israel has been set aside, and God's primary vehicle of accomplishing his will on the earth is the church. So yes, friends, you are a tool. You are God's tool to build his kingdom. Nobody's excited about that. that you are the, the very tool that God is using to build his kingdom. That's exciting. He set aside the first way he had intended and said, now I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to build my church and my church, my bride is going to be the tool that I use to build my kingdom. That's exciting. But during the tribulation, the church will be no more on earth, right? We won't even be here. So God picks back up and completes his plan for Israel. The tribulation is thus sometimes referred to as Daniel's 70th week. If you look at Daniel 9, That'll make sense. We won't cover that right now. We don't have time. But this is when all of Israel will look on the one whom they have pierced, and so will be saved. The people remaining will, will, will say Jesus is who Jesus says he is at that time. The saved Jewish people are sometimes referred to as the Jewish remnant. Um, though uh, Revelation 14 speaks of only 144,000 as being spiritual virgins, they are not the only spiritual virgins in tribulation. All of Jewish remnant during the tribulation, all of the Jew Gentile believers could be considered spiritual virgin, vir virgins. It's these spiritual virgins of the tribulation, these Jewish and Gentile, it's not just Jewish, because some Gentiles will be left. All of these believers who are in the view of Matthew 25, they are in tribulation waiting for Christ and his bride to return to earth for the celebration. When he returns, according to Matthew 25, these virgins will go out to meet him. Matthew 25, 2 says we, we read of these virgins, and some of them are wise, and some of them are fools. Now, I know if you've spent any time in church whatsoever, I don't care if it's one day or 40 days, 40 years, I don't care how much time you spend in church, you have noticed there are certain people in the church that you absolutely have no doubt in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit that these people are sold out to Jesus Christ. And then you've got this other group of people that kind of just show up and go through the motions. You ever seen those kind of people? Okay. I don't want to get too harsh here today, but the reality is this is what we've got. We've got some people who are wise and some people who are foolish, some people who are wise that it's entering into that relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the savior of the world. I don't believe that every man, woman, and child is saved. I believe that he is the savior of the world, but not every man and woman and child is saved. Why? Because not every man, woman, and child has allowed Jesus to be Lord of their lives. There's the difference. Okay, there's a wise and a foolish. So let's go back to Matthew 25, uh, verses 2 through 5. That five of them were wise, five were foolish. Half. Does that seem about right in the church? Okay. Verses 3 and 4 reveal why some are wise and some are foolish. Because those who are foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise ones took extra oil for their lamps. They prepared. The difference between the wise and the foolish is that if the wise had had enough oil... Um, 
that the wise did have enough oil for the lamps, the foolish did not. That's the difference. Preparation. The torches they carried were long sticks. One end was wrapped with rags and strips of cloth that had been soaked in oil to begin with. If you've ever made a torch, you ever made a torch like that? Okay. If you ever have, it only burns for a few minutes. The ones that the virgins carried, I'm told, burn for a maximum of 15 minutes. That's all you got. You got 15 minutes. That's not a very long dance, you might say. Now, Kimberly's the, the dance instructor. She might think differently than that. 15 minutes for a dance might be a long time. But in context of what we're talking about here, it's a very short amount of time. Now, if, if that were all the oil they had, they'd only have 15 minutes. But if they took extra oil, they could make the torch burn longer. And they would, re they would repeatedly soak the strips of cloth in oil, and they would carry with them a little vial or a vessel or a pitcher and with the oil in it. And every so often, the flames would begin to diminish and they would pour more oil onto the rags and they'd keep the flame lit. So here we learn that five of them forgot to bring any extra oil. They had their torches, forgot the vessels. It's a silly thing to forget, but it, and highly unlikely that anyone would forget to bring an, an oil vessel with their torch, but that's why the, this parable is so memorable. These foolish virgins truly are foolish for forgetting something as simple and essential and important as the oil which is the very fuel that makes this work. Oil represents something very significant, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But for now, let's, let's fill the picture with what happens. Look at Matthew uh, 24, verse 5. While the brood, bridegroom was delayed, they all slept. So nothing's going on. They're at rest. They're, they're in a place of, of just no action. Many people say the difference between the wise and the foolish versions is that the foolish ones slept when they should be awake. And watch, well, verse 5 is clear. They were all sleeping. They were all, right? They all slumbered. They all slept. In the church age, we are constantly to be on the alert. We are to be awake and watchful and slumber not, for we do not know when Christ will come for his bride. That is what we learned in Matthew 24. And as believers in the church age, we must not think that the Lord delays his coming. When's Jesus coming back? Anybody know? Soon is all we know. That's the only answer we have, soon. So do we sleep? Do we slumber? Do we stop watching? Do we stop preparing? Do we stop looking for his return? No, he could return at any moment. Could be this afternoon. Could be tomorrow. Got to be prepared. Now, now, if you're scared about the idea of Jesus coming back, that would tell you that it's time for you to, to prepare. The good news is, if you're scared, that's telling you you have time to prepare. You can do it. That's a good thing. If, if you think of Jesus returning, get giddy, that's also good. But here in Matthew 25, 5, it's clear that the Lord delayed his coming for whatever reason. It's the exact same word in Greek that's used in Matthew 24. And this is another proof, by the way, that these virgin, virgins are not Christians living in the church age. Instead, they are living during a time when the Lord's coming is truly delayed. And the only time in history that it could be is during the seven-year tribulation. As they are in this tribulation, they know at the beginning that there will be turmoil. There will be widespread, uh, then there will be widespread peace and prosperity. But during this time, all Christians will be safe and God will not allow them to be touched or harmed. But the very middle of that week, that seven-year period, the abomination that causes desolation will be set up at the temple. Then there will be three and a half years of the great tribulation and that'll begin. And then at the point, Christians will be persecuted and killed. Okay. Therefore, it's okay for them to slumber and sleep during the first three and a half years. Now, you may have been saying, well, they should be awake and watchful. Well, no, it's a time of peace. They get a break. They get a rest. It's, it's appropriate for them to sleep so they can gain strength and be well prepared for the trials in the final three and a half years. This doesn't mean they become fat and lazy. It doesn't mean they compromise with the world. They are virgins. All of them are spiritually pure. All of them are living faithful in faithful obedience to Jesus. They know that the Lord's work must be done in the Lord's way and especially in the Lord's timing. But if they go out early and they begin the work he's called them to do, they would just be wasting their energy and would accomplish nothing. You ever jump out ahead of God? Think you're doing something for the kingdom of God and you do it your way instead of the way that he outlined? You ever done that? What happened? Waste of time. 
Wait on the Lord. Let him guide you. So they slumber, they rest, they bide their time. These virgins spend the first three and a half years of the tribulation resting up for the final three and a half years of intense ministry. There's no folly in the slumbering and sleeping. The wise virgins do it too. So this is what the torch dance virgins did in Jewish cultures also. They knew that when the groom came for his bride, the time for the dance was near. They knew that if they were going to dance all night long with their oil burning, they must be caught up on their sleep. Kimberly, do you tell your girls in your dance recital to make sure they rest before the recital? Right. Why, why would you possibly tell them to rest before the recital? So they're refreshed and ready to go because they're going to expend a lot of energy pulling this task off. Same thing with these girls here. So they should rest and slumber. Guess what rest is, church? It's part of preparation. You ever have something really, really important to do and you did not rest and you did what I do and stay up all night long because you're excited about it? Then what happened when you went and did it? I, one of my favorite examples was Jesse fencing. Jesse didn't eat breakfast, stayed up all night long because he was going to his first fencing match. And let's just say that um, my son got his proverbial hind end handed to him in the match. <laughs> and he says, thanks for bringing that back up. But he didn't rest, he didn't prepare, he didn't eat. Eating and resting are part of preparation. He didn't do that. And he found out a valuable, valuable lesson. Rest is a part of preparation. If you notice, if you read through the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus went off by himself to do what? Play video games? Stay up all night long reading a book? Watch some Netflix? What was he doing? He was sleeping. He was resting. He was preparing away from the distractions. Sometimes you have to do that. So they do receive the call. They have to be prepared for the call, and they do receive it in verse 6. Uh, in the middle of the night, there was a shout. Here's the groom. There he is. Here he comes. Then all those virgins got up, trimmed their lamps. Now, I told you trimming a lamp is a colloquialism of the time. Now, if I say trim your lamp, what do you think I'm saying? Cut it right? Because we use the word trim to cut something. Trimming a lamp was actually lighting the lamp. So a lot of times when you read this passage, a lot of people would say, what they, why were they doing trimming your lamp? Well, no, they were lighting it. They were setting it on fire. They were adding fuel to it. They were getting ready to go. This is it. Here he is. Started on fire. They had all the lamps and they were able to light them, but the foolish virgins realized, oh no, I'm out of oil. Oh no. And all this time to prepare, it did nothing. They forgot to bring any extra oil. Their torches cannot burn for very long. But the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, give us some of your oil. Yeah, you know, that works out like that quite often, doesn't it, right? The people that don't prepare, look at the ones who did prepare. You know, I remember being in Boy Scouts and forgetting to bring any like trail bars and like other guys that, you know, you'd have that one kid whose mom like would go to, you know, buy like, big massive box of like granola bars and and he, he barely has any clothes with him his backpack's filled with granola bars you're like dude let me have a granola bar you know and usually that was the same kid to go no you should have brought your own you know the same kid right but he was right i should have brought my own why didn't i bring granola bars i didn't even think about it because i don't really like them i don't like granola bars until i've been hiking for about eight hours and eating nothing suddenly i like granola bars right but i'm not thinking about that that's not where my eyes are at. I mean, my eyes are not in preparation, but his were. He had all the granola bars in the world. I mean, there's a sh granola bar shortage because they're all in his backpack. But the foolish versions say, hey, give us some oil. The wise ones say, no. Why? Because they realize that if they split their reserves, then nobody will have enough. You realize that? Five don't have enough. Five have plenty. But if they split it, then all of a sudden, there's not enough for anybody. It sounds like that by sharing, everybody has enough, but they don't because it can't continue to burn if they only have each of them have a limited amount. So they tell the foolish virgins to go find some, go, go to a merchant, go buy some, go get your own. This would have been difficult to do, especially at a late hour. Well, it was really hard to be out in the middle of the woods after walking for eight hours. It was really hard to find a um, granola bar store 
I didn't find one. So let's go back to the oil. First of all, a lot of people would like to say that the oil means salvation. Now, if the foolish virgins were not saved, they would have not been called virgins. Furthermore, if the oil represents salvation, they would not have been told to go buy it. You can't buy salvation. So the oil does not represent salvation. Salvation is given free of charge to anyone who wants it. Jesus did his job in Calvary and became savior of the world. But the salvation part, the grace has already been given. But then man says, I believe it or I don't believe it. I want Jesus in my life or I don't want Jesus in my life. Those who reject Jesus have not made Jesus their Lord. That's a scary place to be. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For by grace you are saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so no one can boast. The oil is not salvation. What is it? The oil is the preparation. The oil is the preparation. Oil is fuel. Oil is preparation in this, in this parable. You need to have the oil for the fuel. Now, when Pastor Brian was here two weeks ago and last week, you understand there was a charge to every single person in this church that you have a ministry, that you are a minister of the gospel, that you have a position, that you have your marching orders. What happens if you get out there and start marching without your oil, without your fuel, without your preparation? What happens? Oh, it's easy. Same thing that happens to the torches. You burn out fast. You ever met somebody that was really on fire for the Lord and they were in church for a couple years and they burn out and now they're an atheist? Why? Because they didn't prepare. They didn't continue to pour the fuel and the preparation onto their torch. They didn't do it. They sat in the pew and relaxed. They didn't prepare. And when the Lord came, when the bridegroom came and said, here's your marching orders, here's your ministry. No, I can't do that. Why not? I'm not prepared. Can't do it. Man, sometimes Jesus steps on your toes and sometimes he just breaks them off. I don't even have any toes anymore. It's a harsh thing to hear, but it's a good thing to hear. Not because it hurts us, but because it causes us to realize we need to prepare because we need to get going. The wise virgins prepared because they had enough oil to get them through the night. The foolish virgins were unprepared. They had a torch that lasted them a few minutes or so, but that's not enough. See, what, what the torch is for the modern church is emotions. You get fired up, fired up. I, I, did, I was crying up here tonight, today, right? But my goal is not to cry and worship. I cried as a response to realizing who he is and who I am. And who am I that the Lord would even call me to do this, what I'm doing right now? Why would you choose? I wouldn't choose me. I'm not going to ask you if you choose me. I don't want to know. <laughs> but I wouldn't choose me. Me? Sean Browning to be a pastor and a worship leader and a, to do all that? No. Come on. I wouldn't do that. But God did. And he doesn't care that, that my lamp is jacked up. He cares if I've got enough oil. He doesn't care that I used my lamp improperly earlier on in my life. He doesn't care that my lamp is damaged. He doesn't care that my lamp is spoiled or, or rusty or dented or discolored or sat out in the sun too long. He doesn't care about that. He wants to know how much oil do you have for your lamp, Sean? How much preparation do you have? How much fuel do you have? Are you running out of fuel? Well, that's okay. You can get some more. So if you and I are not willing to take the time and expense to build up our spiritual reserves while we have the chance, a time may come when a crisis happens in our life, a sickness, a death, a loss of finances, a job, persecution. What happens when those kind of things hit you in the church and you're not prepared? Do you think that takes, takes some, of, some of your faith? Does it deplete your faith? What about divorce? 
Some of you have been through a divorce. Some of you have been around a divorce. Some of you understand what that does to a family, how it depletes them spiritually, how it pulls them away from God. You understand this. And I'm not judging. I'm saying this is a fact. This is what happens. And if you're not prepared, if you don't have enough oil, you might not make it through. I'm sure Mark felt like he wasn't going to make it through a few times. But guess who was prepared? Mark Turney. Guess who made it through? Mark Turney. Guess who kept his lamp lit? Mark Turney. Probably didn't feel like it, but he did. And my dad died. I didn't feel like coming to church. I was preaching this Sunday after he died. I didn't want to. Didn't feel like it, but I did. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying at that moment, I had preparation that led up to it. Now, did that deplete me spiritually? Yes, it did. It took a lot of wind out of my sails. I'm just now getting it back. But thank God I was prepared up to that point because I might not have had the wind in my sails to carry me to now where, my, where the sails are filling back up with wind, where my vessel is being filled with oil again. You think you're out of oil? You're wrong. He will fill your vessel again. He will do it. No matter the condition of your, of your lamp, he will fill it again. But you have a part in this too. See, we'll find that we don't have enough spiritual reserves to get through tough times if we don't prepare. And these times we'll look at, at those who made it through a similar trial and say, I wish I had your faith. There are times I looked at Mark and I'm like, I wish I had your faith. You're going through a divorce. I'm going through, you know, my dad dying. I wish I had your faith to get through what I'm going through. And of course, you know, I can't say to Mark, can I have some of your oil? Can I have some of your faith? Can you deposit some of that into me so that I can go through my thing? You see how the ridiculous it sounds for the foolish virgins to ask for the oil? Because he can't give me that. Jesus can. Faith and spiritual strength come only through discipline. It comes only through constant reading and studying of the word. It comes only through praying without ceasing. It comes only through personal preparation. It comes only from a personal God. It doesn't come from a concept of Jesus in spirituality and churchianity. It doesn't come from that. Now, real quick. Oh, I've only got about 14 more pages to go. That's okay. Hang in there. We have to get into the word while we have the time. That is the preparation. That's the place to start. I realize it's been a long time uh, since I've done any physical workout. I know we might be shocked to take a look at me and think that this guy, you know, hasn't worked out in a long time. That might be shocking for you to hear that. But um, <laughs> you may look at me and, and see someone who uh, doesn't, you know, that probably needs to, to maybe do some exercise. But if my next 10 years are like my last 10 years, problems will begin to develop. I'm 53 years old and I have to prepare. I have to put some oil in my physical lamp in my body. When I reach 60, 70, I still won't have the strength and stamina that many of you have to start continuing to serve the Lord with my body, soul, mind, and strength. I have to prepare. So that's been on my like forefront of my, my mind to prepare physically, to start working out. The same is true for developing spiritual strength and stamina. What, whatever you do now, take it up a notch this week. Get in the Bible more. Memorize one extra verse a week. Pray for five extra minutes. Study scripture five minutes longer. Start devotions with your wife, your children, your friends. This is the church age. You don't get to do it after the church age. You get to do it right now. It's a privilege. Christ could come back at any moment. But also, we are living and understanding that we must prepare for the future as he will not come. We, we were to prepare as if he will come in our lifetime. We're to be watchful and alert at all times and never think that the Lord delays his coming. We're also to use the days and hours we have now to prepare ourselves for whatever the future might hold. Jesus said that if the world hated him, it's going to hate us. You're going to see this more and more, especially now that we have Facebook and people can Google things to respond to you. Don't let that get sucked up into nothingness. 
waste of time. Here in the United States, we think we're relatively safe, but listen, Rome fell in one day. One day by barbarian hordes. We can't be so proud to think that our nation might not face the same fate. And if it happens, if you're alive, will you be prepared? I'm not talking about a cave in the mountains, stockpile of food or guns. I mean, if all of a sudden it's illegal to be a Christian, what are you gonna do? Would you be prepared to stand up for Jesus no matter what? Do you know enough of the Bible that you could get by without having one? Even if this doesn't happen, even if the United States continues on as the greatest, richest, most powerful nation in the world for many generations to come, are you making preparations now to hold the fort for future Christians? Europe used to be a Christian stronghold. The Reformation began in Germany, Switzerland, and France. Those are all pagan nations today. It wasn't that long, really. In the grand scheme of things, it didn't take that long. The United States isn't really that far behind. Christ may come back tomorrow, but if Christ does not return for 25 or 50 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, there will still be a Christian, will there still be a Christian influence in the United States? Will it still be here? Not if we keep going the way we're going. Alistair Begg, I don't know if you know who that is, very famous uh, speaker. He thinks that if we keep going, if we keep going the way we're going, we're only 25 years away from becoming a pagan society. 25 years. That's it. We have to prepare while there's still time. People say there's no time to prepare. There, there's too much to do. We would, we would be so much more effective in what we do if we had taken the time to adequately prepare. Remember Paul? The Apostle Paul. What happened to him? On the road to Damascus. Encounter with Jesus. Do you realize from that point to the point of his first ministry, it was 17 years? 17 years. Now we read the Bible, it's, it looks like, oh, he just got right up and started doing ministry. No, he was preparing for 17 years. He, he, God had him spend these years in pre preparation before his first missionary journey. We're thankful for Paul, but we should be even more thankful for the 17 years. Some of you are probably saying, I've been waiting for God to give me my ministry. I've been waiting for my marching orders. I want to know what I'm supposed to do. Instead of looking at the time of preparation you have right now as a gift. The time where God says, will you please just sit down and listen to what I'm trying to tell you? That's a gift. Jesse um, has not performed any open heart surgeries, and I'm thankful for that. He's, he's, he's in a, he's in a, you know, pre-med program. I don't want him operating on anybody right now. In the same way, I don't want somebody who's very young in faith, just running right out and starting to do ministry. In a lot of cases, those are the ones that are hurting the church. They're not prepared. You know what happens? Their lamp burns out. When their lamp burns out, it's not effective but their mouth still runs. Ouch. Good pastors and teachers have to go through times of studying and preparation for ministry before God will use them. It took Moses 40 years to get his BD degree. You know what a BD degree is? Backside of the desert. He was in the desert for 40 years while God was changing him and molding him and turning him into something, somebody else, a better person, preparing him. And God called on him. But even Jesus spent 30 years in preparation before he began his three years of ministry. We look at the giants of the faith or what we think are giants of the faith. I don't know. Maybe God doesn't think they're giants. We look at them and go, wow, look at they're reaching out. They're affecting people and they're, all these things are changing. What if the one person that you walked alongside and help them with their faith and help them to grow. What if you only did one? Well, what if that one person went on to affect millions of people? Was that one person important? You better believe it. So the foolish virgins prepared, uh, failed to prepare. So when the bridegroom came, they were not around. They had gone to find oil because remember the, the wise ones sent them off to go find oil. Well, they're not around. Bridegroom shows up and they're trying to go find oil. Their spiritual reserves of oil are only built up over time. The foolish virgins go to get some oil, and as a result, they miss the dance. Don't miss the dance, church. You can miss the dance by thinking that you've got to rush to the dance. 
allow the preparation to happen. So in verses, uh, verse 10, when they had gone to buy some, when they had gone, so we know they left, when they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived. <laughs> of course he did. Then those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. The door was shut. Later, the rest of the virgins also came in and said, Master, Master, open up for us. But he replied, I assure you, I don't know you. Okay, they did not miss entrance into eternal life. There's no suggestion that the foolish virgins are now going to hell. That's not what we're saying here. There's not a mention of suffering. There is not even a mention of weeping and gnashing of teeth as we saw in uh, chapter 24. Zane Hodges, he's a theologian, suggests that those Christians living during the tribulation who do not have the strength and stamina, stamina to get through it are those Christians who die in the tribulation. Matthew 24 talks about the love of many growing cold. This is like their lamp going out, the light being snuffed. But then Matthew 24, we're going to go back here for a second. Matthew 24 says, the one who endures to the end will be delivered. So this is not talking about eternal life, but surviving the tribulation. Even down in verse 22, this is how the word saved is to be understood. Jesus is saying that those who have enough oil who have enough strength to persevere and stay faithful, it's those who God will protect and allow to survive the tribulation. Why? So they can accomplish Matthew 24, the preaching of the gospel into all the world. All right. Those Christians who die in the tribulation still make it to heaven. We read about them in, in Revelation 5, verses 9 through 11, which Mark will get to, and Revelation 7, 9 through 17, where they are pictured as waiting for the tribulation to end. Why are they waiting? Because until the tribulation is over, there's really not a place for them. The bride and his bridegroom are still in the wedding ceremony, in the wedding supper, which do, they, they do belong to. Then there's a wedding celebration on earth for the elect who survived the tribulation. But these, since they did not survive it, can't take part in that either. The door has been shut to them. But when the new kingdom begins, there is a place for them. They will be given their rightful place in the kingdom so because they have died, they miss out on the torch dance they were supposed to take part in. They miss out on the welcoming Christ and his new bride back to earth. When the celebration is over, they will, start be, they will still be part of the kingdom, but they will miss out on the special privileges of the dance of the celebration. They still want to perform the function they've been called to, but when they're asked, Jesus goes, sorry, you do not have any part of this. This is not a statement that Christ doesn't know who they are. The Greek word here is oida, which carries with it the idea of respect, appreciation, and honor. The word does not mean that they don't have a relationship with them, but that he does not know them in the sense of honoring them. The other five, the wise ones, come on in, let's get this, let's, let's start this dance. Jesus counted on them to provide the entertainment for his wedding celebration, and they were supposed to be there for his bride, but when they were called, they didn't show up. It would be like if your musicians didn't show up for your wedding, but they wanted to come to the reception. <laughs> because they had failed to do their part, you probably wouldn't want them at the reception either. Okay? It's insulting and disappointing. But then they don't show up, Right? So the door is shut to them, the door to the celebration, not to eternal life or, or even the kingdom. Christ concludes the warning in Matthew 25. And I think this, this is where he speaks to the application for us. We've taken all this time. And I know this is a long, long lesson. lesson. Thanks for hanging in there. I hope you guys had um, some uh, uh, granola bars out there. And, you were, you know, I don't have one here. I'm not prepared with granola bars either. But... I hope you did. I hope you still got the strength to get through this. We're almost done. Hang in there. Because the last verse, verse 13 says, Therefore, be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour. The virgins didn't know. We don't know. So we don't know when he's coming back. Be ready. Get prepared. This is about believers living during the tribulation, but there's an application for us as well. Some Christians today are looking for Christ's return, but not preparing for it. All those doomsayers that say, it's going to happen on this date. Great. Where's your preparation? You don't see any. You just say to them saying, this is the date, and you better know that I'm right, and send me money, or what, whatever it is that they're trying to do. Okay? But you don't see them preparing for it. The Bible says that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. The real test of our strength is not when things are going well, but how we react when things do not go well. 
We all know men and women who became Christians, as I said earlier, that lived faithfully for God for a while, and then something bad happened in their life. They lost a loved one. They, they contracted a terrible illness. They lost their job, faced financial difficulties. Maybe all these things happened. Maybe because of these adversities, these people are no longer attending church. They're no longer walking in fellowship with God. They discovered they don't have oil. They ran out of steam. They ran out of fuel. If, if they were saved, they did not lose their salvation. They just didn't prepare well enough for the times of trouble. Just as there are these sorts of Christians in our day, so also would be these sorts of Christians in the tribulation. We're almost done, I promise you. May 1984, National Geographic showed um, through colored photos and drawings a swift and terrible destruction that wiped out the Roman cities of Pompeii and uh, uh, Her Herculaneum in AD 79. The explosion on Mount Vesuvius was so sudden that the residents were killed while in their routines. Men and women were at the market, the rich in luxurious baths, slaves at toil. They died amid volcanic ash and superheated gases. Even family pets suffered the same quick final fate. It takes little imagination to picture the panic of that kind of a day. The sad part is that these people did not have to die. Did you know that? They didn't have to die. Scientists confirm what ancient Roman writers and, and, and these ancient Roman writers re recorded weeks of rumblings and shakings that preceded the actual explosion. Even an ominous plume of smoke was clearly visible from the mountain days before the eruption. If they'd only been able to read and respond to Vesuvius's warning, the mountain itself was telling them, this is going to happen. There's going to be a travesty. You're going to die. The mountain itself was telling them that. Well, I, I don't want to risk being a doomsayer because I'm not a doomsayer. I'm going to risk this by saying this. There are similar rumblings in our world today. Warfare, earthquakes, nuclear threat, economic woes, breakdown of the family and moral standards. While not exactly new, I'm not saying those things are new. These things do point to a coming day of judgment. People need to be, need not be caught unprepared. God warns and provides us an escape to those who will heed the rumblings. Let us therefore watch and get ready. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. We want to thank you again for this great music venue. We pray immense blessing over the venue, over everyone that works here, everyone that runs it. And we pray that, that you would uh, do something really awesome with this for our, our Fort Wayne community. God, we pray for um, all of our leaders. That are, We just found out some other leaders contracted COVID, and even some NFL players, uh, political leaders, anybody that, you know, has contracted this disease, God, we ask that you, you would, would breathe into this situation, that you put your hand on it, that you would protect all of us here from COVID. Uh, God, I pray that you would ignite that fire, the fire that, that drives us to bring extra oil, to be prepared, to carry our lamps and be prepared with more oil, to, um, Stay in your word to pray, to get our focus on you and not on temporary things. Lord God, we thank you for being with us here today. Uh, we ask that um, you would just help us to continue uh, to stay in a mindset of worship, even when we leave here. Let us be a people that have a lifestyle of worship, just not, not just a, a momentary thing that, that we do here on Sunday. I ask God that you would Help us to grow. Finish the work you started in us, Jesus. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Any thoughts? Yeah, the sermon was too long.